Hello, I'm Stephen Toop, Vice Chancellor of the University of Cambridge, and I want to welcome you to this Cambridge Conversation, the closing plenary of this year's Alumni Festival. Following my conversation with our panel, there will be a Q&A of roughly 25 minutes, so get ready to pose your questions. It is unequivocal according to the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, that human influence has warmed the atmosphere, ocean, and land." End quote. Global weather patterns are severely disrupted. Europe and China have experienced terrible floods. Greece, Canada, the USA, Russia, and Australia have battled apocalyptic wildfires, and desertification threatens food security and sustainable livelihoods in the dryland regions of Africa. To mitigate these dangerous patterns and to regain some stability in climate and weather systems, we must make rapid progress to net zero global emissions. What we do in the next decade will determine the viability of humanity's future. We will discuss today what needs to happen to get us to a place of relative safety and whether COP26 represents a pivotal moment. In 2019, we established Cambridge Zero, connecting our talent, convening power, and incredible work across the university with a global network of leading partners to create a platform for change. Cambridge Zero's work is advancing our understanding of climate risk, developing solutions to mitigate the damaging effects of climate change, and progressing initiatives to adapt and build resilience to climate change. We're harnessing the full multidisciplinary power of the university's research and policy expertise to accelerate climate action. Cambridge researchers are involved in collaborations that cut across almost every discipline and across countries around the globe. With international collaborators, our researchers are developing self-powered devices optimized for low resource environments. Our computer scientists work with conservationists to harness technology to better understand and reverse habitat loss. And the university's aviation impact accelerator brings together experts in aerospace policy and climate science to identify the action required to achieve net zero aviation. We have some of the very best researchers in the world at Cambridge and talented alumni who hold positions that are key to combating this crisis. But it needs all of us, each and every person, to take action and for organizations, governments, and communities to work collaboratively with the ultimate aim of securing a sustainable future for all. Here to help us understand the climate crisis a little bit better and the measures we must put in place, I want to welcome today's panel. First, Dr. Emily Shuckborough, who is the director of Cambridge Zero. An alumna of Trinity College, she's an internationally renowned climate scientist and a friend of COP26. Joining us from Nairobi is Dr. Linda Nkata Jichuya, an alumna of Hughes Hall and a Gates Cambridge scholar. Linda is currently a lecturer in building physics and architecture at the University of Nairobi. She's also involved in developing both Kenyan government and international policy frameworks. And finally, Alistair Phillips Davies, who's an alumnus of St. Catherine's College and chief executive of SSE PLC. SSE provides low carbon infrastructure supporting the net zero transition and is the UK's largest generator of renewable energy. SSE is a principal partner of COP26. Well, panel, let's get right to it. COP26 has been described uh, by various people as the world's best last chance to get a runaway climate change under control. Is this uh, an overstatement? Uh, how significant is COP26 in your view? Let's start with you, Emily. 
I mean, it is really significant. So the last big climate conference was in was in Paris um, in 2015, and that's when the world came together and did agree um, to keep temperatures well below two degrees of warming with an ambition to keep them below 1.5 degrees of warming. We're now um, edging up uh, at about 1.2 degrees Celsius of warming, so horribly close to that um, to that limit of 1.5 degrees. And and if there's anything that that needs to be in my mind the overarching ambition of the upcoming negotiations in in Glasgow, it's that we move from ambition from these you know overarching targets to actual action. Um, and what we need to be seeing is increased commitments from countries around the world to reduce emissions, to put us on a pathway to ensure that we don't exceed 1.5 degrees of warming with all the climate impacts that that would um, entail. And, to, and, and also to look more broadly than just emissions reductions, but also looking at how we can support um, adaptation and building resilience in countries around the world that are going to be affected and already are being affected by the impacts of climate change. And that also implies um, ensuring that we we support the right flows of finance to help um, to help those countries uh, build that resilience and and uh, and secure their their sustainable futures. That sounds like a big agenda, Alistair. How optimistic are you uh, about COP twenty six in terms of uh, its its importance and our ability to act, as Emily emphasizes? No, I, th I think they're really good points. Um, look, every conference probably wants to feel like it's the most important, but I, I think this one perhaps does. Uh, I think I, I get a real sense of a parallel between the public health emergency that we've seen over the last 18 months and the climate emergency. Um, uh, going back to the, uh, that warming, the, the recent IPCC report uh, noted that the world would pass one and a half degrees warming um, probably in the early 2030s. So the time really to act um, uh, and actually get things done is is now, um, and I think that's uh, I think that's important. I think in the context of the business world, it's going to be really important that we get clarity of action. Probably recent elections in America, uh, statements by China last year have perhaps given us the chance to get real targets set uh, and a wider agreement amongst the G20 and more globally. Seeing those targets set gives the direction companies like mine want, and they also give investors in companies like mine. Um, real comfort that um, that they can put billions of pounds into all the major projects that we have to do, uh, and that they're going to see a return on them in the future. Um, so I, yeah, I, I would agree. I think it's uh, it'll be an interesting uh, an interesting twelve days. So it sounds both like both of you see it as a as a a signal moment. Linda, do you share that view? Is it is it really fundamentally important? Yes, uh, thank you. I think those two points really rhyme with what I think would mark the significance of uh, COP26, especially uh, tied to these 12 days of talks where you expect um, more than 190 world leaders and multi-stakeholder representation from business, from various areas of human service, uh, from citizens participating. And the hope is that the action plan that Emily and Alice have just mentioned after these 12 days will not only be uh, just to illustrate potential of net zero, but hopefully uh, it, it, it will show actively, it will actively position this potential within the decision-making spaces of all those who are attending in a way that if all those attending uh, uh, and can leave Glasgow with at least 100% capacity to anticipate uh, the impacts of climate change across maybe 50 years in their decision-making spaces, be it in governance, be it in the economic sector, be it in the health sector, and drill down to the numbers of the worst that could happen if we do not act. And also if we can get those uh, actors closest to 100% capacity to not only anticipate, but respond uh, and respond actively without under providing, and also how to recover 100% uh, from the effects of climate change um, and ensure that those strategies stand the test of time. I think if all the attendees live empowered this way, um, then this will mark a major significance for actioning that we all want to see in the climate change space. Uh, thank you so much, VC. Thank you. That's great. Uh, so I mean, the message here is that this really is a very important moment, and, and I'm delighted to say that many Cambridge staff, students, uh, alumni are involved in many capacities at COP26. 
Uh, Emily, I mentioned that you're a friend of COP. Uh, tell us what that means. And, and uh, what do you hope Cambridge and, and uh, other people who are contributing here from Cambridge uh, can contribute to COP26? Yeah, so uh, I am one of the friends of COP26. That's a group of, of people from around the world, actually, who are involved in helping uh, at a high level support the, the COP um, uh, presidency, um, seek really uh, ambitious outcomes from the, from the um, conference in, in Glasgow. But more generally, I mean, as you said, across the university, our, our staff, our students, our alumni have been playing really significant roles over the last, um, well, year and a bit now um, in the run up to to COP. One of the things that we've been doing um, in partnership with other universities across the UK, we formed a, a universities network. It has more than 80 UK universities now who are part of that. And we've been undertaking collectively a suite of different activities in support of COP26. Um, one of those activities which we from Cambridge led on was organising a large virtual conference in back in May, um, which we had a more than five 500 speakers from around the world and, and attracted an audience of coming up to 5,000 people um, from pretty much every country of the world um, uh, in terms of that conference. And in fact, we've got a second conference that's starting tomorrow, which is focused around climate risk um, and both understanding what those climate risks are, whether that's in terms of extreme weather events or um, the risk of, of tipping points in the climate system, or indeed looking at cascading risks and the danger of cascading risks propagating through through um, global society and importantly how we can build resilience to that. Um, so there are many different ways in which um, as a university we've been trying to support the process with that singular aim of um, seeking an uh, ambitious outcome. Uh, that's exciting. Uh, while we talk about ambition, Linda, I gather that you have been working on uh, something called Visions for a Global Net Zero Future. Tell us a little bit about what the hope is behind that work. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think through this visions work, which I'll describe uh, in, in two minutes, um, uh, as I was an in-country expert, um, and we managed to do uh, some high-level stop ticking of climate action across six representative regions, including UK, Kenya, Jamaica, India, Brazil, um, the United UAE and uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And through this talk taking, I think, um, presented different varying contexts of regions. On the one hand, uh, regions that, of course, uh, have different sectors that contribute to the GDP. And also seeing that alongside the varying context of climate action was quite interesting to see. I think it was particularly interesting for me to review Kenya, where I live and work, alongside, uh, which is a developing country context that is agriculture-led uh, economy, alongside different and other sectors, like for instance, the UK, which is mostly predominantly service-led and is developed alongside natural resource-led economies like Saudi Arabia, ETC. And I think this visions project gave us an opportunity to, to frame what a net zero solution space looks like um, in the lead up to COP26. And so we got a chance to uh, identify key challenges um, that are already being experienced around the world, especially in implementing climate change that we need to have at the back of our minds, especially the, the, the challenge of uh, everyday insecurities around livelihood, which always comes up when you mention climate change management. We're also able to identify um, opportunities for net zero transition that can either be achieved uniquely within the countries or collaboratively, or ways in which other countries can learn from each other because of the different spectrums of climate change action. We're also able to achieve um, and, and see likely barriers of, of net zero and what the priorities are likely to look like. Where key priority uh, that kept popping up was a need to enhance strategic knowledge for climate change across the world, as well as having that comprehensive governance system. And the hope is that this um, evidence-based compendium of sorts uh, will encourage uh, that delivery of ambitious and more far-sighted inclusive commitments <clears throat> that you want to see post-COP26. 
Thank you. Excellent. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Emily, you want to? No, I was just going to say, I was just going to follow up on that. If, if people are interested in seeing the visions that, uh, so we so we in Cambridge um, led this uh, project in partnership with Deloitte and, and, and academics like Linda from, from the different countries she mentioned. So people are interested in seeing the visions that um, came out of those um, projects. Then if they uh, search on the web for the futures we want, um, then they'll be able to find the, I think, really inspiring visions that came out of uh, each of the different countries than the consultative exercise that we conducted. Great, the futures we want. So Alistair, you are a principal partner of COP26 uh, and as a leading business person, I'm curious what you hope uh, might come from the business community at COP26. Yeah, um, I think that, well, there's a, there's a couple of points I'd make. The first is that I think targets are important. We mentioned that earlier. Um, if we just take the UK, I think it was important that the UK set a strong interim target. They went for 78% reduction by 2035, which is a huge step um, from an 80% reduction by 2050. Um, so that was good. And that sets us clearly on a one and a half degree pathway, which, uh, which Emily referred to earlier as being so important to look at. I think my second point, though, probably is a bit more about frustration with the speed at which we can translate um, targets into highly effective actions. Um, some of that you can lay clearly at um, governments around the world's door to set policy. Um, so how they've got difficult decisions to make about policy. I know um, participating from the UK government uh, work with the G20, Trying to persuade all of the G20 to sign up to one and a half degree was difficult. Trying to show how we closed all our, our coal-fired power stations uh, in SSE uh, and how the UK had powered past coal and essentially was the, the leader in terms of carbon re reductions amongst the G20 nations. Um, you know, we certainly came up against some frustrations there. I think equally, although these things are boring, um, how we get new market mechanisms, how we put in place things like consumer protections, um, I, you know, I suspect we'll touch on a just transition somewhere, uh, somewhere in this discussion. Speeding up planning permissions without um, disenfranchising, um, you know, statutory bodies who want to do these things. Um, at the end of the day, what I'm hoping out of COP is that we um, come with a real action orientated uh, agenda, and that we actually leave having agreed a number of things that we need to do between um, not only businesses, but governments as well, who can set policy that help businesses um, get on do the things they do best, which is just execute. So again, we have an emphasis on uh, really concrete actions and steps that will move us towards the goals. One of the goals uh, that is uh, put forward for COP26 is collaboration. Um, how does that shape up, Linda? What does collaboration mean to you? And do you have any examples of where you really see collaborative approaches working best? Yes, yes, I think I think that what would make for successful um, collaboration, either international collaboration, regional or even local collaboration in country, is, is if co uh, cooperation or collaboration is able to achieve two key things. Um, if one, it's able to integrate that macro world of ambitious uh, summit level discussions and also policy discussions with, with those micro levels that we all know of um, as individual implementers, with those macro, micro world individual implementers in such heterogeneous spaces that, that in, uh, are in our world globally. And if two, if it's able to have that comprehensive governance system that can coordinate interests of different stakeholders, that can regulate different policy arms that of the proposed um, action plans, that is able to address far reaching social, cultural, geopolitical, local politics, and also have that one, uh, that feedback mechanism and all strategic op related actions. Those two make for successful collaboration. Collaboration. And, and I think I can share with you an example where I have seen this uh, level of cooperation structured work best. Um, it's in the space of um, responding to the current uh, global COVID-19 crisis that we are all facing that has been so action packed and we can see some commendable positive results coming from it. And um, I can give an example here by the government of Kenya um, in efforts to cascade uh, globally determined COVID-19 public health measures. 
in its distinctively different spaces. So Kenya has different pockets of spaces. There are formal spaces, informal spaces, rural spaces, urban spaces, which are dramatically different and have different ecosystems. And it was particularly challenging for the government at the time to apply all these measures cascaded globally. And uh, to, to, to align to that, uh, there was a comprehensive blueprint uh, for pandemic response and recovery, particularly uh, to accommodate the most vulnerable people, especially living in formal settlements. It was developed to provide a more holistic urban and regional governance of public health um, that would include all the socioeconomic soups that we have in our country. And for the first time, very clear value chains of managing informal settlements uh, formally was developed. And I think why it is important in the space of climate action, especially now that we hope for a net zero resilient blueprint coming out of COP26, after uh, this, this uh, blueprint can be patterned after this in a way that uh, manages this intricate uh, space, developing how to develop elastic uh, climate change policies that can accommodate different spaces. It can also offer guidance in managing communication and coordination in, in ways that synergizes efforts towards this one goal, and also making visible uh, and managing collateral vulnerabilities that come about, especially when, when implementing national and global directives. And of course, to meet the four goals set for COP26 will require such collaboration. And such collaboration spaces, I'm sure we all know, um, are quite complex with many moving pieces. And there's need to see all of them in one space and manage them in a blueprint format. Thank Great. you. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Emily, uh, you've already mentioned Cambridge Zero's convening role here, and, and Linda's just uh, stressed the complexity of collaboration. I, can Cambridge Zero help through convening to actually facilitate collaboration, or is that too, too big a task? No, I, I mean, absolutely, and I think it's actually one of the key things that we're able to do. In fact, actually, the reason that Linda and I have you know, the project that we were working on, the Futures We Want um, project, I think was a really good example in itself of that sort of collaboration, where we um, convened a, an expert group through through the network that we have in, in the university and have developed over decades with um, academics in, in countries around the world, but particularly in the global south. Um, and uh, so we convened a, a, an expert committee. We then supported that with postdoctoral researchers from Cambridge um, to identify the evidence base, uh, you know, which sort of outlined what's feasible in terms of a resilient net zero future for each of those countries. And then we collaborated still further and we engaged a much broader range of stakeholder groups um, and, uh, and the project as a whole was, uh, was coordinated by Deloitte. So we brought in that business side of things as, as well. Um, and that uh, by bringing in that much wider range of stakeholder groups, in, including um, uh, many different community groups, um, we we were able to not we'll take that evidence base that outlines what's feasible and then put the lens of what's desirable on top of it and it was a really nice um, example of that sort of collaboration and we've been conducting exactly the same sort of collaborative um, initiatives convening groups at a local level as well so um, we've been working uh, around in the in the Cambridgeshire and Peterborough region um, with communities here looking at how the region can move to a, a net zero future and looking at some of the key challenges for the region one of which is the um, the future of farming in the region. We're sitting in the Fenlands, um, which are large um, peatlands, and uh, at the moment they're large sources of emissions. And what we're doing is working with the farming community, with conservation groups, with wider groups throughout the community to look at how we can um, look to a future for the fens that is um, good for climate, good for biodiversity, but also good for the people who live in the region. And, and, and it's a region where actually there's a lot of inequality and social problems that need to be addressed at the same time as those environmental problems. Mm -hmm. And they're not uh, disconnected, obviously. Um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change recently warned in its report, uh, and I quote, nowhere is safe. That's a very strong statement, a powerful one. Uh, and Alistair, you talked about a just transition. Presumably a just transition implies that communities uh, are involved 
in establishing what needs to happen uh, in order to address climate change from their perspective. How, how do we ensure that uh, the voices of communities and particularly the, the most vulnerable in communities are actually heard? That must be part of a just transition. Yeah, I, I, well, all the communities that we go into, if we if, if we think of the infrastructure that we're building, um, when you build on large onshore wind farms, they tend to take a few pieces of land, um, and therefore the local communities always have a, a, a say in the planning consents and things of that nature. So we put a lot of work in uh, to that. When we when we go offshore, um, that tends to be a lot more work. Uh, the communities there can often be bird life, um, you know, and, and sea life and fishing stocks. And indeed, we've got a collaboration with Microsoft at the moment um, uh, on the puffing counter, as I call it, which is uh, using some AI they've got to um, to measure the health and impact of uh, of, uh, of the biggest wind farm, of offshore wind farm in Scotland um, on puffing colonies there. Um, so so. Uh, Whatever those, uh, whoever those stakeholders are, I think we're acutely aware of what we need to do for them. Um, and I think that you mentioned the just transition there. The just transition is something that, that's important in the sense that as we hopefully decarbonize um, the planet, we also do um, good things as well around that rather than bad things. Um, I think you can get uh, climate goods and climate bads, I suppose we call them. Um, you know, you get costs associated with these things, uh, costs of lost livelihoods. If you're in the oil and gas business, are you going to lose your job um, going forward? Are there additional costs on goods and services because flexibility is more difficult to provide? When the wind isn't blowing and the sun isn't shining, uh, then obviously a lot of renewables we're building today just don't work as effectively. Uh, and, and, and therefore figuring out how you deal with that um, can, be, uh, can be quite costly. So I, I think for us, we're very, very focused on it. Um, we were the first company in the world to produce a just transition strategy uh, at, uh, at the end of 2020. We'll be updating that document shortly. Um, and I, I think generally, um, as you look at how we take things forward, if we're going to spend lots of money, whether it's uh, even investors' money, but we're going to do it on the back of government policy, um, there's absolutely the point that we have to have the public good at our heart and we uh, um, we have to be seen to be doing the right thing so the society supports all the investments that we're making and feels like it's getting um, a fair return on them whether that be in terms of uh, jobs looking after the you know environment whether they're newts or crested newts are quite a good one or slovenian grebes or whatever the fish fish communities are that we see all of these things need to be looked at if we're really going to have a license um, to go and operate and build all the assets that we want to to take us through uh, to take us through this huge transition that we've got to get through by 2050. Thanks, Alistair. Let's move from that that uh, sort of big infrastructure vision to something that Linda emphasized earlier in terms of uh, informal settlements and informal economy, et cetera. On this question of engaging with communities and hearing from them, Linda, uh, how is that best accomplished? Any any good examples? Yes, of course. Uh, I think I think uh, on, on that case, one of the most vulnerable communities, especially in developing countries, you find uh, and whose voices need to be heard in this journey of transition are those who live in informal settlements and also run informal businesses. And of course, you find the effects of climate change compounds the existing problems in these spaces very differently for, uh, from the way they do uh, formal spaces. And also the solution spaces for net zero are different uh, in, in, in both cases. In Kenya, for instance, sense, um, the informal business sector, if I could quickly define it, is, it includes businesses that are either not registered, they're either based on individual efforts, they mainly remain unprotected, they lack social security, and a lot can be said about slum uh, architecture that we, we are all, we, are all we, we see around the world. And these businesses, just to put some statistics in context, uh, account for, in Kenya, account for 34% of our GDP and also 77% of employment in the country. So it's a significant amount. And from a climate change action and also investment point of view, you find informal business value chains just because they're in the informal space, uh, their value chains still remain underutilized. 
And I'll give an example that rhymes with what Alistair has mentioned, especially in the energy sector. You find um, charcoal. Charcoal business is a booming business in the informal sector, and it's used in an estimated 82% of our urban spaces and 34% of our rural spaces. And yet we know charcoal is a driver for deforestation. And of course, there lies opportunities, endless opportunities to transform this space um, sustainably by exploring other options of bioenergy. But if you will put that alongside the formal sector, where um, there are many projects currently being envisioned, especially by the government of Kenya, that are quite formal and include those macro formal operations of, of renewable energy, you find in terms of transition and, and carrying people along with you during the transition, there's a real need to create complementary opportunities for, for this informal sector, which has a significant um, presence in our, in our country. Um, thank you. Thank you. E Emily, I know that you've been a tireless champion of ensuring that the voices of children and youth are heard in, in the climate uh, debate and, and in terms of finding ways forward. Just tell us a little bit about why that's so important and, and, uh, and how it can better be ensured uh, in conversations like COP26. Oh, I mean, it's incredibly important that the youth's voice get up because they're the people that are going to be living through. <laughs> you know, it's the decisions we make today that is going to be determining their lives the rest of um, rest of this century. Um, one of the things that we've been doing um, to help support that. Um, together with that network of UK universities that I mentioned earlier, and um, a global alliance of universities that we're part of um, on climate. We've um, been uh, putting together a film that will be launched at COP26, Act Now film, um, which has specifically gone out to countries around the world and asked um, a young people to outline their concerns, their fears, and their hopes um, in terms of climate change. And uh, it, it's just one example where we've been trying to uh, do what we can to em empower young people so that their voices are heard by the key people who are going to be making decisions on their future. I noted uh, that uh, many alumni who joined us for last year's climate crisis session uh, are attending today's event, uh, and uh, those who participated will recall, recall that we spoke of hope in what might turn a corner in terms of our, our carbon emissions. So we're going to come to uh, questions soon for uh, the wider uh, audience, and please do uh, keep sending your questions in. We'll try to get through as many as we can. But before we do that, I would like to pose a final question, and that is if COP doesn't take forward decisive coordinated climate action, let's hope it does, but if it doesn't, uh, where do we look for reasons to be optimistic? Uh, presumably, we don't want to pin every hope in the world on this one conference. So where else do we look for reasons to be uh, optimistic? Uh, Alistair, let's start with you. Yeah, sure. Well, look, I'm, I am optimistic. Uh, as, as you know, to politicians, I think, can, um, can sometimes fall out for all sorts of bizarre reasons that many of us see in, in business and academia wonder about. But governments are not the only actors um, with agency when it comes to tackling climate change. Um, there's an awful lot of other people there. Obviously, I, I was delighted to get invited along this evening. Uh, academic institutions like Cambridge, up and down, uh, up and down the country, and indeed all over the world, uh, in Kenya as well. Um, cities, regions, businesses, investors, all of these places have a very powerful voice, I think, in how we take things forward. Um, I think lots of people understand that climate risk is a huge financial risk, uh, and it's a huge risk to people's livelihoods. Um, I think, uh, the financial side of it's important. It's, it's why I've been pleased a few times this year to be on some more of these Zoom calls with Mark Carney, former governor, uh, governor of the Bank of England and, uh, and also Canada as well. Um, he's doing a lot to try and ensure that financial systems are, are changing, uh, that climate risks are being recognised, uh, things like TCFD, uh, and opportunities for factoring into capital allocation decisions um, uh, uh, in the long run climate change is right up at the top of that. So I think there's a, a role for everybody to play. I think we're gonna hear a role from um, uh, from a, a current student uh, at the university as well, who's gonna put a few questions to us later. So I would just encourage everybody to get involved. 
Um, it's not just COP26. I, I, I really hope we get a, a big agreement on one and a half degrees. And I really hope we share some great ideas about how our business and other businesses around the world can bring that alive. But everybody has a voice in this. You know, it, this planet belongs to all of us. Linda, what about you? Reasons to be optimistic outside of COP26? Yes, I, th I think we, we all have reasons to be, remain optimistic beyond COP26. And I think for me, the most encouraging section, especially in putting together the Net Zero Futures project, was a section we compiled on uh, local emerging sectors um, of climate change action in all these representative countries, because it shows that a lot is already being done and, and mostly in need of either upscaling. And you find that there are also so many action points and plans that are under consideration, but mostly tucked in policy uh, dockets or uh, in-country climate change plans to meet Paris Agreement. And you also find uh, activities that remain desirable, especially in the, in the science space, that need further planning to make them implementable. So this still keeps me optimistic. And if you allow me, I can also leave you the optimistic space that I've been uh, a part of, especially in Kenya, um, about this program that ran for a year during this COVID-19 crisis uh, called Kazimtani, uh, which in English translation means um, jobs in the in the neighborhood. It was, a, it was a project developed to targeting youth residing in informal settlements and also done in a way to engage them in activities to improve environments in informal settlement spaces. But then in, in just seven months, um, we were able to plant 19.2 million trees across the country. We were able to pick and collect 3.8 tons of, of waste in informal settlements, which is pretty significant because informal settlement uh, microclimates are known to be two to three degrees hotter than the central business district microclimate. So that was quite commendable. Low cost and community constructed net zero projects were implemented across the country using stabilized outlooks. I don't want to say so much, but there was a lot <laughs> in this project there's a lot in this project that would remain and keep us optimistic especially because it also managed to not only achieve those deliverables but it was also able to capitalize on our youth capital and also was socially conscious and also it's a solution that showed how it's possible to um, empower the economically marginalized in the climate change management process so yes there's still a reason to remain optimistic so a lot Thank on you. local action there emily any other other thoughts for you from you on how to uh, how to remain cheerful or optimistic? Um, so I think the way that I, I'm optimistic outside of COP is to look inside the university, because as you mentioned at the start, Vice Chancellor, there is so much exciting research going on right across the university, whether that's in terms of new battery technologies that are going to be essential as we move to increased electrification, whether that's in terms of uh, digitalization, new digital technologies that allow us um, to uh, just organize our lives in more efficient ways with a reduced um, environmental footprint, whether that's in terms of developing nature-based solutions or indeed looking at technological ways of removing greenhouse gases um, from, the, from the atmosphere. There are so many different um, ways in which university research is delivering ideas and innovations that are going to help us move towards a um, resilient net zero future. And the other thing that I would emphasize inside the university is our students. Um, they are so passionate and enthusiastic about um, this topic, and they are going to be the leaders of the future. Perfect. Well, that's a, a great segue, Emily, because uh, as uh, Alistair mentioned earlier, for the first question, and I'm going to come to our, uh, our audience very shortly, but I'd like to uh, invite uh, Zach Coleman, who's the undergraduate president of the Cambridge University Students' Union and co-founder of the Jesus College Climate Justice Campaign, to pose the first question. Over to you, Zach. Well, hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me, and thank you for a very interesting discussion so far. Just before I ask my question, I'd like to say a particular thank you to Stephen for his leadership on the university's response to the climate crisis. I think we've made really exciting progress um, over the last few years. So in 2019, Cambridge was one of the first UK universities to set targets for emissions elimination. For those who don't know, committing to reach absolute zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2048 with an ambition to be 10 years ahead for two of the key emissions grades. Now, without wanting to invoke 
um, the long-standing Oxbridge rivalry. Since then, Oxford University has committed to reach net zero emissions for all of its emissions grades by 2035. And Glasgow has gone even further, committing to reach net zero again for all three grades by 2030. Would you agree that in order to continue to build on our growing reputation as a sector leader in climate emergency response, the university should now consider bringing its, for its targets forward and including all of its emissions in line with plans like Oxford and Glasgow? And for the panel members who are external to the university, what role do you think Cambridge can play in modelling best practice in the area of climate action? Thank you. Thanks very much, Zach. Uh, maybe, Emily, I'll start with you on, on the more internal aspect of that, if I may. Just, I, I guess, a, a way to phrase it is, uh, how, how hard do we push ourselves when we're not sure how we're going to get there? And I think that's the, that's, the, that's the question that certainly the University Council will ask itself, I suspect. Uh, Emily. Yeah, so I think, I mean, my answer to this for the university is the same answer that I have for the world, actually, <laughs> which is that we need to move from ambition to action. What we need to have as a university is a really clear action plan, an ambitious action plan um, as to how we're going to actually achieve our um, emissions reductions. And that needs to be the collegiate university um, and, and all the, you know, the, the wider um, assets of the university, um, uh, you know, we are, and a key part of that, actually, to come back to some of the discussions that we've been having over the course of the event um, this evening, is collaboration. Um, collaboration across the university, sharing ideas. You know, each of the different colleges um, are coming up with the same challenges as the university centrally in terms of, for example, um, working out how we're going to uh, take gas out of our estate and find alternative ways of providing heating, um, how we look to future transport policies across the university. Um, and, and it's also connected to the wider environment as well. So it's not just about um, uh, our, our emissions, it's also about our use of water, for example, or our impacts on biodiversity. Um, and all of that needs to be uh, taken into consideration in the wider um, picture that has come up a few times in the conversation of a just transition. We need to be thinking, you know, about, about social justice issues at the same time as climate issues. So this is a really big challenge, but I think the key thing is that we need to be moving from ambition to action at a global level, at a local level as well. Thank you. Uh, Alistair, I wonder if you have any suggestions about the areas where the university should be looking so that it can actually make the kind of ambitious pledge that uh, that Zach's asking for and also uh, can deliver as uh, as Emily's emphasizing. Sure. Um, well, I'd be careful about making overly ambitious pledges. Um, you know, I think if the planet was going to decarbonize by 2030, uh, based on current technologies of those you might expect, I suspect you'd get quite a lot of mass extinction going on. Um, you just get people dying of lack of heat and shelter and things of that nature. Um, and and there have been a number of rather sad and apocalyptic reports about that. So people have to be realistic. Um, you know, I, th I think I think you got there first, and I think you can come up with some revised plans as things move forward. Uh, as Emily says, finding action. I think working with people on things that that, that work for you. Dealing with heat is going to be a major problem uh, for you. I think even government has issues with that. But you know, we've been talking about heat strategies in this country since 2008, 2009. Um, and we still haven't come up with one yet. Um, moving forward with things like hydrogen, with carbon capture and storage, which I see as a transition um, technology into that, um, I think will be important. Uh, but ultimately, I would advocate partnerships with people who can deliver for you on, on reducing your carbon and also trying to get alignment of uh, some of the amazing research which you do um, with, climate, uh, um, with climate goals and whether whether that's fracture mechanics of ever longer blades, um, we're building the world's largest wind farm at, um, uh, at the moment out on Dogger Bank in the North Sea. The blades there are 108 metres long. Um, we're probably going to go out to 120 metres next. It, you know, the technology that, um, that people used to look at for fracture mechanics in materials when I was there an awful long time ago uh, uh, and all the rest of it, those things need to happen. So I think, I think you've got two opportunities, but... Uh, the university has enormous brain power and has an, a, a fantastic brand. And I think it's utilizing that with partners to try and come up with that plan that will deliver, deliver the actions that Emily's talked about. Thank you. Uh, any uh, advice from you, Linda? 
Uh, yes, thank you. And and just spinning off what, what Alicia just mentioned about utilizing the university's brain power, I think a key need we need we, we need in, especially in the science space is to safeguard these terms, uh, net zero and resilience, so that they don't lose their currency, like the brother and sister sustainability, um, in, in in very um in, in a way that it's very easy to define what these terms mean across so many uh, scopes, across what they mean. In in the built environment, what they mean in the health sector, what they mean, so that then we are able to, to, to raise that awareness and generate discussions of these issues that uh, remain less consistent in different spaces, but more hopefully bringing the university on board to bring in the consistency of these terms so that then we are able to move together and, and it's, this action is, is trackable. Um, thank you. Great. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Zach. Um, we have lots of questions from the audience, uh, and I'll try to lump some together uh, without making them too complicated for our panelists. Um, one, a couple of people have asked questions about the UK government's white paper uh, to get to net zero and whether or not it's an adequate model that might be relevant elsewhere. Uh, and related to that is, are we doing enough to accelerate the energy transition? Um, Emily, do you want to comment on that? Um, so, I mean, you know, in many ways, the UK has for a long time led the world in terms of um, uh, its response to climate change. We were the first country um, to put in a climate change act, which has been an incredibly powerful policy instrument in, in driving um, change. And uh, we, we were the first um, uh, uh, developed nation to put in a, a net zero target as well. Um, so I think especially with us hosting the um, climate conference in Glasgow, all eyes are on us um, as a country um, in terms of helping to define um, a, a net zero pathway and, and more, bro more broadly, you know, with globally still in the midst of a global pandemic and the challenge is how do we move out of that pandemic, recover global economies and at the same time um, put, uh, 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 prioritize the response to, to climate change, both in terms of reducing emissions and, um, and making countries more resilient. Um, so, so I, you know, clearly it's important that we really do demonstrate that leadership. And I think that there's, uh, there's more that we could still be doing as a country if we really to show ambition. Uh, Alistair, could you comment on, on uh, accelerating the energy transition? This must be something you think about all the time. Yeah, look, I, I, I think the UK's got a lot of policy, uh, and I think there's things to be learned from that. Um, uh, I also think, you know, we've worked on a report, there was a, re a report we did with uh, KPMG recently to try to take the lessons um, of the last 15 plus years um, to, to demonstrate why we've been at the forefront of what the G20 had, uh, had, um, had done. We also worked with LCP recently um, on getting to net zero without breaking the bank, sort of five big ideas on how you could save 50 billion pounds um, by doing some more central planning when you're there. Um, for me, you start with a policy and you start with a, a clear framework that people can invest with. You then need to look at getting rid of the um, the, the things in the way, whether it be planning and, and things of that nature. How do you slim that process down at the moment? An offshore wind farm will take us eight to twelve, uh, um, between eight and twelve years to develop, or probably ten to twelve years. Even bringing that down to six to eight years would be a big, big help. Um, so the question is, how do we do that? Business is good at suggesting ways to do that, but we need to work with governments and local authorities. Uh, it's important to get alignment uh, on that. I think the investment is there. Um, but it is about being able to put the pace, uh, uh, um, the pace on the ball and look at what the other issues are. So um, we've got a, a strong target to get, uh, to get to 40 gigawatts of offshore wind. We're the biggest offshore wind market in the world. One of our big uh, barriers at the moment, as I see it, is transmission. It's the onshore um, transmission lines that are the problems. Um, we built some of them in the north of Scotland. National Grid obviously do a lot of them as well. Um, and the issues there are essentially we used to hook up uh, coal, um, uh, coal mines which had power stations on top of them. Now we need to hook up places on the coast um, and we need to get that done reasonably quickly. We're going to have to build transmission lines probably at something like eight times the pace we, uh, we have done over the last 20 or 30 years over the next four, five, six years to get those things built. So a lot to be done um, and a lot of practical actions to be taken. But people just need to keep knocking these issues down. 
um, and then I think we can get there. Thanks very much, Linda. A lot of people are asking questions about how policy development and climate action can really address deep socioeconomic inequalities. And particularly, uh, how do we take account of the fact that a lot of the real burden of climate change is being uh, felt in the global south? Uh, I mean, this must be something you think about all the time in your context of, of uh, teaching in Kenya. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the question. And, and I think, of course, uh, to move forward, uh, we need to manage these challenges, especially in the developing countries context where, of course, discussions around how do you decouple these economics uh, from growth, uh, from, from greenhouse gas emissions? How do you secure um, livelihoods? In, in transition? How do you uh, ensure regional diversity? Um, that that uh, regional diversity in itself is a major challenge uh, in managing climate change because we have environmental diversity, we have deserts, we have tropical islands, we have the, the sea line, which are different and uniquely different cultures. And uh, of course, over 50% sometimes of the population is dependent on climate change sensitive, sensitive sectors uh, of livelihood. So there are major challenges there that need to be managed, even as we think about those very technical deliverables uh, of climate change. And hopefully, um, as a post COP26, there's a need to take forward a not only coordinated action, but also action that uh, can be trackable across across many sectors and positively felt within economies, uh, positively felt within our happiness index in a way that climate change management is not seen as a separate deliverable, but it's also felt in other aspects of our lives and positively. Uh, and, and there are many ways to do this, especially uh, in drafting uh, policies that are, are elastic, like the one I mentioned about um, uh, the elastic policy on including informal settlements in, in certain aspects of, of delivering climate change management um, that I don't want to get into now and get too technical, but there are ways of, of seeing all these aspects of changing risks and different spaces in one space so that then we are all working from the same or reading from the same script as a the decision makers and also the recipients of, of the same decisions. Thank you. Thanks. Emily, uh, there are people interested in how we connect the discussion around climate change to population growth. And this, of course, also connects to what, uh, what Linda's just been talking about, because much of the population growth we experience is in the developing world where the burden is already being felt. Do you think that the correlation between population growth, human growth, and the use of energy and global warming is adequately dealt with? And is it, is it front and center enough in uh, climate discussions? I think this is all connected through the sustainable development goals, actually. Um, so, you know, the, the sustainable development goals are, they are about climate, they're about the environment, they're about, about um, economic development, they're about education, all these things interconnect and you can't look at one area without uh, looking at the other area. You're going to fail in terms of your um, progress on poverty or your progress on education if you don't also look at uh, progress in health or, or progress on environmental measures. Um, and so, you know, clearly if we're going to be um, looking to to support a sustainable world in, in its truest sense, then then we really do need to be making progress across all of those different aspects. And one of the things that I think that we are in a really good position as a university to contribute to is um, taking that um, systems wide approach, looking at those interconnections, uh, understanding how we can um, draw on the innovations across the university, use the university's not only research, but also education capacity, and then linking through to uh, policy, uh, engaging with business in terms of helping to support those solutions as well. And I think that's one of the ways in which we really can be a really positive, powerful force to, for good in terms of global society. Uh, Emily, could you just expand a bit on uh, what Cambridge Zero is trying to accomplish in relation to education? Because it's actually one of the questions that's coming up uh, quite a few times here. What's the, the role for a university like Cambridge from an educational, not just a research standpoint? 
Yeah, so uh, I mean, it's one of the key pillars of what we're trying to do with, with Cambridge um, Zero, as you as you know, Vice Chancellor. So we are looking both internally at the education we provide our own students, and in fact, um, we had um, a an intern working in with us over the summer, specifically looking at that and, and consulting with the student population, and uh, it was. Um, really heartening to see that in every single subject that's taught in the university, um, the response was that the students are wanting more climate related information um, to be included in those um, subjects. So we're very much looking at the education we provide our own students, but we also recognize that we have a much wider role in terms of a provider of education. So we're looking at the entire lifelong learning journey. So how we can support um, education in schools, including including engaging with um, Cambridge Assessment, Cambridge University Press. Um, we are looking at how we can support um, reskilling and, and skills training to support the jobs of the future through apprenticeships, through our Institute for Continuing Education. We're looking at um, how we can support um, executive education. There are already many programmes that are run um, through the Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership, um, supporting um, executive education around this. There's a new programme that's at launching tomorrow, actually, um, that's a collaboration with um, our investment office and uh, uh, the Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership to look at helping support um, decision making in the investment sector um, uh, to be more uh, in, in line with um, sustainability criteria. And, uh, and we're also looking at how we can um, help provide education beyond uh, 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 beyond those the, the, those more formal constructs and um, we're looking at how we can help uh, provide education to our alumni and, and beyond around climate change so uh, is it I must say this is one of the elements of, uh, of the Cambridge zero work that I personally find most exciting because uh, you know I often think that one of the greatest um, transfers of knowledge, technology, hope that we uh, accomplish in the university is just simply through our graduates going out into the world. And we see that in Linda and Alistair uh, right in front of us. Uh, so I, I'm very grateful. Unfortunately, we have run out of time uh, because we could go on, I think, for at least another hour with the questions that are coming in. And they were great questions. But please uh, do thank our excellent panel, Linda, Alistair, Emily. Uh, great insight, uh, I think, about how to move from ambition to action. If there's a, a mantra here, that's what it is, uh, I think, from today's panel. I hope the session has given you all in the audience uh, cause for reflection and indeed for hope. On Thursday, the 18th of November, we're going to be hosting a post-COP26 Cambridge conversation where we will be discussing key developments at the Glasgow negotiations and next steps. So I hope you can join us again for that. This session draws our 31st Cambridge Alumni Festival to a close. Over the course of five days, we've hosted more than 90 sessions from across the Collegiate University, from intimate fireside chats to virtual tours of gardens and museum collections. And I'm delighted that this virtual festival has brought together more than 4,500 alumni and friends connecting you with Cambridge thinking and extraordinary research and education from across our six schools. Thank you for all of your brilliant contributions, everyone who's been participating and particularly to the audience for incisive questions which have made the 31st festival so engaging. It's been a real pleasure for me to play a part in the hugely successful alumni festivals and of course this year's no exception. Uh, remember, you can catch up on key sections from the 31st festival on our YouTube channel. I'm gonna leave you now with a message from the COP26 People's Advocate and our most esteemed alumnus, Sir David Attenborough. A little over 150 years ago, one of Cambridge's graduates, Charles Darwin, published the theory of evolution by natural selection, one of the most disruptive ideas in the history of human thought. But since then, Rather than cherish this planet, our home, its diversity, fragility and beauty, we've only too often continued to treat it with contempt. Today, as a consequence, we face disaster on a global scale. 
The climate stability of the past 12,000 years has come to an end. And around the world, we are now suffering from the impact. At the same time, nature is declining at rates unprecedented in human history, with as many as a million species facing extinction. We're running out of time. If we do not take dramatic action, we will witness irreversible damage to our natural world and risk the collapse of our societies. But there's still hope if we all, every single one of us, take our share of responsibility for the future of life on Earth. And that is why Cambridge Zero is so important.